So after watching your inner fish, um, let's think about maybe some of the details that were happening in there. Uh, when I introduce a film for the first time, usually I, I ask you to look for the broad things, the big things, and with hopes that you pick up detail along the way. Um, and um, let's get to some levels of detail maybe that you can remember. And if you haven't, it, it, you might want to think about watching the film one more time. Um, and let's see if we can answer some of these questions. All right, so um, what was the narrator looking for? What, what was Neil Shubin looking for? Well, we should think about it. He was looking for that transitional fish, right? Um, the first of the stegas to move from the freshwater fish uh, finally into the first uh, reptiles, right? At least the amphibians making that online traffic journey. What job does Neil Chupin have? He's a fish paleontologist, but also um, he is the chair of the medical department at the University of Chicago. Very important. Um, when did mammals first show up? What do you think about that? Uh, 200 million years ago. So we got to get some benchmarks about what the film was talking about. We had to grab onto those major things that were going on. You know, even when you think about Sir Richard Owens, he was in the cartoon section. He was he was sort of focused on as this as this major uh, uh, um, anatomist, and he was he was the one that collaborated actually with Darwin, and they had a love hate relationship. I don't know if you remember that in Sir David uh, in Attenborough's film on on Darwin, The Tree of Life. But uh, what was the first? He was the first uh, scientist to notice what skeleton pattern. About it. What's the skeleton pattern? And Neil Shubin would elaborate on this, right? The one bone, two bone, lots of little bones, and the digits. And of course, we can refine that later in the course to the, the humerus, the ulna, the radius, uh, the carpal bones, the metacarpals, right? And finally, the phalanges. Um, but the one bone, two bone, three bones, and lots of little digits. That's very important uh, for us to start thinking about evolution, that we all share those common traits. Okay? Um, so when you think about where did he go? Where did Neil Shubin go on his expeditions? First one was Pennsylvania in that road cut, and that was actually along the Allegheny River. I've actually been there to Red Hill. And then finally into Greenland, into the Arctic. Right? So in the early stages of development, all animals begin as what? Remember he approached that? He was looking in there? A single ball of cells. And those cells are practically identical to each other. And, and that gives us information. That is actually a vestigial feature in its own uh, that um, we start out basically the same thing. And then genes take over and begin to differentiate as we become separate species. But that should also tell us something about the commonality of life. Okay. How about Molly? Remember Molly in the film? What does she possess? What was different about Molly? Remember the Richardsons? They went over to the Richardsons' house. Neil Shubin did. Um, and then he met Molly, and then she had something right here on her ear with little holes in it, right? Those are the vestigial features, right? Those were the pits, right? There were our leftover gill slits that something had gone wrong in her development since so she was an embryo, and old genes that were used for fish were actually turned on mistake, or they were altered slightly to express a different genetic pathway, and before she got too far into development, that began to expand as a gill, then the right genes kicked in, turned it off, and she's left with that little feature, which means that the gill structures in fish, you know, correspond to uh, not only the ears, but the nerves, right? They correspond to the ears and the nerve systems um, of, of humans. And so make sure you sort of review that too, to figure out, you know, what features in, in other animals feature prominently in the hours that were displayed um, within that film. Those are the vestigial features. Uh, how about the fossilly found, Tiktaalik? So what does that mean, Tiktaalik? I think you mentioned that at the very end of the film when you found it. Let's think about it. Tiktaalik. Tiktaalik. It means large freshwater fish, right? He allowed the Inuit people to develop their own name. And that's what we paleontologists do out of ultimately respect. You know, we find, you know, species that make our careers. You know, it, Neil Shubin became famous. That's why he was able to produce this video. Uh, because he found you know a species on someone else's tribal lands so um you know because of that we owe them some respect too and one way in which we do that is we allow the people to actually develop their own name for it and that's why that genus remember it's the genus uh was labeled that there are many different species of technology remember the one he found was only like a meter long but they found others up to nine feet long all right so the last thing i want to think about in this um 
Neil Shubin says uh, there's the one piece of anatomy that's in that fish that was beginning that transformed the world. What is it and why? What is it and why? Think about it. What is it and why? Look what, right where he begins with, it's the human hand. That's where it begins, and that's where we can see in Tiktaalik. And if there's anything, and I'll tell you right now, that makes us human, it's this hand. You see, without it, we'd be like a dolphin. I don't care how smart you think Flipper is. Flipper is going nowhere. He has no hands. He can't even build a sandcastle. Poor Flipper. <laughs> Stuck at the bottom of the sea. It's this thing that transforms our thoughts into reality. And it's this thing that has to have unlimited range and movement. The fine muscle controls in which he was talking about. The fine muscles that anchor into our tendons here, right? The fine nerves and muscles that allow unbelievable fine control. And you're not going to see this like your dog and a cat. Could you imagine if you came home and you have a dog or cat and it, it stood up on its hind legs and goes like this. Hi, welcome home. Where the F have you been? I'm hungry. You know, if it was doing this to you, you would totally freak out, right? Like there's some, the, the, the thing's possessed, right? Now, this is something very unique to, to primates. Right? Um, and it allows us to, to make a limited number of things. Um, this up here is the result of this. And equally, this is the result of this. So we can think of a human and other organisms of not having a body and a mind which is separate, but we're integrated. You know, one is a body integrated together in form and function. And one piece of the body, like the hand, can tell us a great deal about the other parts of the body, too. Just by looking at the human hand, by looking at this alone, I can understand to some degree what this organism is actually capable of. Right? Okay. Now, the last thing I want to get to in this sort of summary video is that after this will be this module uh, quiz, right? Um, in the quiz will be a combination of true, false, um, and multiple choice questions. I don't want to make these things, you know, drawn out. This is not enough time in these short courses for huge essay questions. I, I don't want to do that. It, it, it is, has never been uh, helpful for anyone. Uh, this one will be roughly about uh, 25 questions is all I'm going to be asking. I don't want it to be too much. They're four points each. You know, while four points each sounds like a big stake in each question, uh, what minimizes that is that I curve the exams afterwards. You know, so if the class average, say, is 72, and I expect a class average of 82, Everybody unilaterally gets moved up 10 points, unless you score a 95, 100 points is your ceiling. And it's in adding those points that that granularity of a four point difference per question sort of disappears. Thus, you know, if you miss two questions and you barely make, you think you barely make an A at a 92, most likely during the exam curve, you'll probably be up somewhere at 96 or 97. And I have found this statistically to be exactly spot on time and time again. Um, and it sort of minimizes the time that you have to put in to these sort of quizzes. All right. So how am I going to do this? Well, if we think about that, you've going to have like maybe 25 questions, you know, I, I will sort of uh, maybe break it down along the lines of, of what we've studied so far. Um, you know, uh, two or three questions from each individual assignment that we have to sort of total a number of 25. Um, how granular will they be? You're not going to expect to see anything like what day was Darwin born. I mean, that, that's absolutely sort of irrelevant. You know, what's important are things, what were the sort of things that Darwin might have seen uh, that, that uh, or, or knew about that uh, would have been helpful for him or essential for him to create a, a theory of natural selection? Maybe who was collaborating with him, right? Um, additionally, what is natural selection? What are the tenets of natural selection? Perhaps, where did Darwin go to visualize natural selection? Additionally, in science, what is science? What is a hypothesis? Uh, maybe you think about who are maybe some of the key players um, in the development of science and what were their contributions? Would you be able to pick out a contribution by a key player you know, in a multiple choice pick list? And finally, when we get to the geological section, we need to think about, you know, what are the principles of geology? Who produced them? Um, and which of a list of ideas would be their ideas? So we can look at a contributor, which one of their ideas should be on this list or not? Uh, you know, questions like these. Um, 
These are the type of questions that aren't going to force you to go into the textbook. That textbook, again, is just for a reference to give you a really deep level if you want to. I'm not going to be extrapolating anything that you haven't seen, you know, either in my lectures to you here or in the videos I presented or in the PowerPoints I put out. All right. So don't go fumbling through the textbook um, uh, for, for, you know, potential questions. I'm certainly not going to do that for you. And I think that that would be too much of a burden. And I really don't think you're going to get a whole lot more out of the course if you do this. Okay. So in the meantime, if you have any, you know, more refined questions, of course, just hit me up by email or by text or by voice. Even voice is probably even better. Uh, I can give you some more refined uh, sort of guidance on the exam if you need it at this point. Okay. All right. So uh, the exam should be uh, posted uh, fairly soon. Look for the date on that on the syllabus and make sure you take it on that date. Okay. I'll talk to everyone later. Bye.